Hello, everybody. Welcome to this temporary return to Tech Tuesday because we're normally back on Tech Thursday. Uh, but because we're doing all sorts of extra activity uh, to get this month's Tech Day in, we've moved it back to Tuesday just for this month. And then uh, next time we will be back to Thursday. So thanks for joining me. Welcome, everybody. If you don't know who I am, my name is David and I'm one of your technical experts here at OM System. I'm here in the UK, uh, but hello to you wherever you are in the world. I hope that everything is uh, fantastic with you. Tonight's Tech Tuesday uh, is going to be about lenses. And I'm not going to lie to you, it's about lenses because right now there are loads of lens promotions going on around the world. So there's loads of money to be saved if you were thinking about picking up a lens. So I decided to pick out, I think I've picked out nine of my favorite lenses uh, in the range, uh, excluding the, the new absolute beauty that is the beast of the 90 millimeter macro, because sadly, as a new release, it doesn't form part of any promotions. But there is a sneaky macro lens in my selection that I've chosen today. So today's Tech Tuesday, as always, is going to be about you throwing tech questions about anything you want at me. Um, <clears throat> if it's from an OMD or an OM camera, lenses, uh, features, techniques, anything that you think I might be able to help you with, Tech Tuesday slash Thursday <laughs> is, is what it's all about. So you can throw all those questions in. Uh, but the focus of what I'm going to show you will be about the nine lenses that I've picked to talk about uh, today. So just real quick, I want to make sure that everybody can hear me. So anybody that wants to give me a hi, I can hear you and I can see you loud and clear in the comments. That would be fantastic. So that just tells me that I don't need to do anything because as always, I'm the only one here. I'm pressing all the buttons and hoping that you can all see and hear what's going on. So anybody that wants to give me a quick yes, all sounds good and looks good would be fantastic. Whilst I'm waiting for that, I will say a quick hello to a few people that jumped into the comments uh, who were patiently waiting before I went live. Uh, Tom in not so sunny California. It rings bells because I'm in Cambridgeshire in the UK and we have had every single season you could possibly imagine in the last seven days. We've had torrential rain, horizontal snow, back up to sunny days. The whole lot. Today, we had a hailstorm that lasted all of 15 minutes, but put, you know, three inches of hail on the ground. So, Tom, uh, I can empathize with what's going on in California right now. Uh, okay. I'm getting all sounds good from lots of people. Thank you, Carol, Edward, uh, Curtis. Excellent stuff. Thank you. And I would love to say hello to everybody, but obviously I can't because there are so many of you. So, hi. And I hope you're well. And I'll try and pick out some of your questions. Remember, I'm on my own, so I don't have anybody picking questions up for me. Uh, so I will try and pick up as many as I can that I can read and talk to you about at the same time. And I'll bring them up on the screen, just like Tom's comment here, who says, greetings from a not sunny uh, Southern California. If I don't answer your question, I'm really, really sorry. I will try and come back into the comments uh, of the main video after the live kind of records itself and comes back to a normal video. So do check back in the standard comments afterwards to see if I've answered your questions and I will do my very best as well. Uh, okay, so we've got a couple of people in that are thinking about upgrading, probably here for some information. So we've got, um, please let me say this properly, Maura. Uh, Maura, who's thinking of upgrading from an EM5 Mark II, which was one of my favorite cameras, to be honest with you, back in the day. Um, to an OM1. So, you know, hopefully if you've got some questions, Mara, you can ask those today and we'll hopefully um, help you look into the new macro lens as well. It's an absolute beauty. Although I haven't had any time to go out with it with our four seasons in one week um, recently. Uh, and lots of people from all over the world. We've got Northern Ireland, we've got Sweden, we've got New York, Minnesota, we've got uh, Wales. I love it when, I, hey, Alan's in Wales. I've always got to shout out people from Wales because some of my favorite people are from Wales. So, hey, Alan, thanks for dropping in. And of course, Alan, and another, my favorite Alan from Durham. Okay, I'm going to stop saying hello to people because I'll be here all night and I'll upset some of you. And I don't want to do that. Um, so, Although I am just going to address the comment that I've just literally glanced at down here, um, which is from Thorsten. Thorsten, I'm really sorry, but I can't answer that question. This is a question that you know, everybody knows I can't answer. If you ask me what's coming next, um, I, I couldn't even tell you under 
penalty of death in the secret bunker room that nobody could hear. Um, I can't tell you about any lenses in the future that are planned um, at all. We do release updates to our lens roadmap uh, every now and again. So we did that with the 90 millimeter that we've just released. And there are a couple of kind of secret areas on there at the moment where you could make some guesses, but ultimately I can't give you any more information, I'm afraid, Thorsten. But I really appreciate you being here and asking the question anyway. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll my comments up to where I think uh, some of my first questions are, and I'm going to leave it there. Because what I want to do with you, I've got about an hour with you guys, and I want to uh, bring in this lens lineup uh, of my nine selected lenses. And all nine of the lenses that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, and hopefully you're going to ask questions on, have some sort of promotion on them all out somewhere around the world. Depending on where you are, that promotion can vary, though. So if you're in the UK and parts of Europe, you're going to get cash back, which means that you buy the lens and then you apply for the cash back to be sent back to you afterwards. And in some parts of the world, like the US, then those discounts are already applied. And that's just because of different economies and the way that that all works. But um, everywhere should be experiencing some benefit to, to wanting to buy a new lens at the moment. So if that's something that you've been ready to do, then hopefully uh, we can tease you with that tonight. Uh, an advert with some education is going to be my most honest way to describe this. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's look at the lens lineup that I've got. So I'm just going to pull this into the stream uh, so you can see exactly what's going on. These are the lenses that I've got uh, to look at today. Now, most of these are pro lenses. Um, they're all favorite lenses of mine to use. Uh, I've put in um, a couple of primes uh, and one non-pro lens as well. So we'll have a take. We'll take a look at these, and we can ask questions and kind of go through. I'll I'll look at each lens uh, for a little bit, and then I'll come back to the comments, and we'll see if there's any questions about those lenses, um, or any kind of general technical questions as well. So let's go ahead and have a little look at the first one. Uh, and I might get rid of my face as well if if these are too small. So in fact. I'm going to get rid of my face. We'll make that a little bit bigger. There we go. So let's look at the first lens on here, which I've got as the 7 to 14 uh, f2.8 Pro lens. And this isn't a new lens by, by any means, but it is one of my absolute favorite lenses because of what it does. Now, there are some things that we need to consider with the 7 to 14. So we'll come on to those anyway. But one of the really important things about this lens is that it is a superb equivalent of 14 to 28 if we're thinking about 35 millimeter standards. So we've got that lovely wide angle. Now, in terms of distortion, if we were thinking about distortion on this, we get some, some minor barrel distortion, some bending of, of perpendicular lines uh, at around the seven millimeter um, end of the, of the range. But when we sort of go to the eight, plus range, that, that barrel distortion tends to fade away quite quickly. Um, and of course, it's nothing that can't be corrected in post if barrel distortion or any sort of distortion isn't what you want. This is not a fisheye lens, of course. That's That would be the 8mm f1.8 lens. Um, but this does create some curvature to, to the perpendicular lines at 7mm. And then beyond that, you're super, super nice and wide uh, and nice and straight. A maximum aperture of f2.8. So you've got that f2.8 Pro Series uh, behavior right through the focal range. So from 7 to 14, you're experiencing uh, a widest uh, maximum aperture of f2.8 if you want it, and a minimum, minimum fully stopped down aperture of up to f22 uh, should you want to go there. Now, obviously, as most of you will know anyway, my recommendation is that you don't go all the way to f22 unless you absolutely have to, because the physics of light and the way that we work with light will start to degrade your image as you head towards that direction. So you've really got to kind of think about that and find that standard compromise. And that applies to all the lenses as we head towards the absolute minimum aperture value of either f22 or on some of the lenses f16, which is the absolute minimum you can go to. So I've broken down these lenses into the groups for those really nerdy ones among us. I love knowing about these. The 14 elements in this one, 11 groups, which contains two aspherical ED lenses, one DSA lens, one aspherical lens, three super ED lenses, one ED and two HR lenses. And as always, when I talk about lenses, it gets super geeky, but I'm trying to balance how much information you all get versus how much experience and knowledge we all have. So I won't go too much into that right now. 
But at the end of this session, I do have a little slide that helps us to look at what those EDDSA aspherical meanings uh, really are in terms of lenses. And what's really important to me as a macro photographer <laughs> is what is the closest focusing distance of any lens? So I've put the closest focusing distance of all these lenses in here. And this particular one is 0 0.2 meters or 20 centimeters um, for your closest focusing point. And that's throughout the range of the zoom between 7 to 14 as well. Most, in fact, nearly all of the Olympus and OM system uh, micro four thirds lens range are built around a seven blade design setup, circular aperture diaphragms with seven blades. Some have nine, but most are around seven. So you'll see that as a recurring theme with these ones. Um, I've put NA integral lens hood applied. This is normally where I tell you about the filter thread size so that you'd know what fil filter thread you were getting on these lenses. Um, but this is an integral hood. So the hood on this lens does not come off. Um, so if you're going to use things like uh, neutral density filters, uh, the sort of real world physical ones rather than the in body algorithmic ones. Um, what a cool word, algorithmic. Well, let's all, all hang on to that for a second. Uh, but if you want to use things like that, then you would need to look at things like adapters that would sit specifically on this. And most of the major brands of filter uh, manufacturers do have a lens adapter, and there are a couple of third party ones as well. It weighs in just over half a kilo, so 534 grams, um, which is, you know, probably sort of the most of the lenses weigh in between 300 and 600 grams. So you're sort of always hitting that mid range, half a kilo range. Um, and pretty much all of them have the zero coating. The zero coating is the Zuiko extra low reflection optical coating. And that's designed to get rid of any ghosting or flares or artifacts within the system. Now, obviously you have to bear in mind that that is a coating that is applied to all lenses, but not all lenses operate under the same lighting conditions. And some extreme lighting conditions can cause more extreme artifacts, which you might have to look at later on in post-production. And it affects lenses in different ways, depending on the angle of view. Uh, and the focal length that we're working at. And this lens has a really bulbous aspherical lens at the front uh, element. So we have to be really, really careful that we don't shoot directly into the sun uh, and get those um, those aberrations and, and, and flares. But it has the zero coating, which does help a huge amount. Something that you'll see also on every single lens that I'm showing you today uh, is the MSC capability. So MSC stands for movie and stills compatible. And that basically means it's a quiet autofocusing system, which is compatible with, with filming video. That's really, really important. Now, we do get a lot of questions about noise from internal recordings on cameras. If that's something you're interested in, please feel free to ask a question. And I will definitely talk about how using external recorders can get you around things like uh, movie AF noise as well. So, oops, not that one, that one, there we go. There's always the wrong button to press. So that's your 7 to 14. The reason why it's one of my favorites is because it's so wide and it's so bright. It's super, super useful for things like night photography, astrophotography, low light photography. Really, really cool. Um, and that kind of shows itself in this one. I wanted to bring in this image by by Adrian Ronfelder, which, it, which was shot on an EM5 Mark III on the 7 to 14. It's the desert at night with the star trails. So this was utilizing live composite mode across 60 second uh, frames ISO 400. It's a really beautiful, warm shot representing both the night and the desert. It's really kind of emotive of those two things. Um, and it's a superb example of the, of the 7 to 14 as well. So really, really lovely shot in there. I'm going to leave that out for a second. Um, let's take away my face. <laughs> Nobody needs to see that. And whilst that's up, I am going to assess um, some of the comments that we've got in here. And I'll assess any statement comments as well. So we've got one here from Mary uh, that says, I used the 4150 Pro lens with my EM5 Mark III to capture an eagle. Handheld, image not good, no image stabilization with this lens. And I suspect I wasn't steady, so I was thrilled to see the eagle. So interestingly, yeah, the 4150 doesn't have any IS built into it, but with your EM5 Mark III, what you are getting is five and a half stops of in-body stabilization. Now, providing that is switched on, and you have a reasonable uh, shutter speed to capture the motion rather than to counteract the um, uh, the kind of 
uh, movement of your hands. It's to freeze the action. So providing you've got the minimum shutter speed that's necessary to freeze the action, then the stabilization inside your body should be more than enough to help you with the 40 to 150 f 2.8 Pro lens. Of course, there is an f4 Pro lens as well. Uh, so it might be worth clarifying whether or not that one is the one that you had on there. Uh, let's see this question from Tom Reynolds, which is absolutely fantastic question. Actually, I love these kind of questions. With an OM1, Tom wants to know, how do I see the subject when at a high f-stop with the 300 mil? So what I'm assuming, I'm going to, I'm going to make some assumptions about this one, Tom, and I'm going to assume that by high f-stop, you mean something like f11 or something like that, which is darkening the frame, uh, in order, uh, to obviously, cause it's stopping down, it's stopping the light coming in, um, if you need to see the subject in that sense, then you can use something called night vision or night LV on the OM1, which is what live boost was on the previous uh, generations of OMD. And it will artificially boost the scene so that you can basically compose your image. It doesn't give you a realistic view of what your final shot will be. It's not a what you see is what you get effect. It's purely lightened for compositional uh, nature. Now, what I can actually do, I've got an OM1 here with me, now so i'm going to pop that one on and we'll switch over to that feed here let's just um go into the menu uh and the menu that you need for this one tom on the om1 is the gear menu which is your sixth one from the left or third from the right however you want to work and then in there you've got your page uh, numbers. So we're going to go across to page three and check out night vision and if we switch night vision on uh, this will now uh, produce a, an icon in the top, uh, sorry, the bottom middle of your screen that says Night LV. And what you're seeing there is I've got a lens cap on, so the camera's desperately trying to lighten something that it can't. Um, but ultimately what we're seeing is uh, a br it will be a brightened view. Uh, no matter what your exp uh, exposure settings are, you'll see a lightened view for composition, Tom. So I hope that helps with that one. Um, perfect stuff. Okay. Let's do another question before we go back and look at another lens. We did desperately trying to balance my time of questions and nine lenses. So, uh, we might even go a little bit over. Um, oh, Hey, one of my favorites. Hey, the macroverse in Denmark. Fantastic to see you in here. Okay. Let's have a quick look. What questions have we got here? Oh, we've got some positive ones. Oh, I'm, should I, am I going to try and say, Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Mouse. I don't know. Mouse. I don't know, mouse. I'm going to go with that and we'll leave it there. And hopefully I've not offended anybody by trying to pronounce this handle. It says, just picked up a new Olympus Mzuiko 8mm fisheye. Oh, what a fantastic lens. Loves, loving that f1.8 speed. It's beautiful. It sucks in all the light. Another great lens for that kind of astro nighttime stuff. Um, you need to obviously take into consideration what you're pointing the lens at, where you are, whether it's short or long distance, and whether or not there's going to be some great fisheye distortion, or whether or not it's just going to look super wide if you have some minimal editing. But yes, it is a fantastic uh, lens. Uh, love it. Um, okay, so, oh, great. Love, I love positive comments are what actually really, really kind of push me through most of the time when we see these. The OM1 is an absolute joy to use. We love that camera and all of the OM Olympus lenses. Thank you, Tim. That is fantastic. Not to say that we don't address anything negative. So obviously, if you do have issues, do send them forward to us because we are always, always listening. Right, let's bring this back in uh, <clears throat> to the stream and let's move across to our next slide, which is the next lens building ourselves up to uh, probably what is one of my favorite releases in the last couple of years in terms of OM system lenses, which is the 8-25. to And one of the main reasons why I love this is because it has uh, a pretty sta a standard filter thread, which hits at 76 millimeters, which means that if you're going to shoot wide angles, landscapes, long exposures, stuff like that, then you can use those adapters um, really easily on a 76 millimeter filter thread. So it is a 16 to 50 equivalent if we're talking about 35 millimeter standards. Uh, it's a maximum aperture of f4, okay? So your f4 throughout the range of 8 to 25 because it's a pro if you want it. So you can go 8 mil f4, tw uh, 25 uh, f4. <clears throat> or its minimum aperture is f22, as is most of the rest of the range. There are 16 elements in 10 groups in this lens, which you can see broken down in that image in the bottom right-hand corner. And I won't go into each individual lens group uh, for each one because we've got them up there. 
uh, the real nerdy ones of us will pause it and have a good old look and then we can discuss at the end. So your closest focusing on this lens is 0 0.23 meters or 23 centimeters and that's throughout the zoom range as well. Uh, a seven blade design setup with circular aperture diaphragm so you get that circular bokeh uh, and it weighs in less than half kilos 411 grams really nice and lightweight superb superb lens crisp sharp and absolutely beautiful to use again it has that zuiko uh zero coating and again it's movie and stills compatible as well so if you wanted to use it for video it is really perfect for everything up to a 50 millimeter equivalent now, the image that I chose for this lens to show it off uh, is this one here by Matt Horsepool. And I just love it. it, it it's another one that's quite emotive for me. I love forests. Um, I love this kind of silver birch uh, type tree that's going on here. I love, I love the matte colors. And it's a really nice angle. This is kind of this upwards looking angle at eight millimeters. Uh, and you can see here that it's not creating too much of a, of a, of a distortion right back at that wide angle, which is superb to have on a lens like this one, shot at F4 on the eight, eight millimeters. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful shot. Um, it's not the smallest of our lenses, but it's also not the biggest of the lenses. So it sits really comfortably kind of in that mid range, like I said, 411 grams. If you're uh, putting it onto an OM1, then you're looking at less than a kilo for the combined lens and camera uh, kind of setup, which is, you know, which is what we're, we're kind of really all about. If you, want to go light this is where we are and this is what we've always kind of shouted about it's uh, it's that mobility that we've got with the system so let's hide that let's do lens comments lens comments and see if we can kind of plan through this one as well hope everybody's liking the uh, aurora borealis color scheme by the way i've seen loads of absolutely beautiful images recently of people taking shots of um the northern lights because the northern lights have been really visible quite far down in the hemisphere unusually far down so so many people have had fantastic opportunities to take photographs of it so i thought i'd kind of match it and despite my dreary cambridgeshire where we definitely don't get the northern lights in the center of town um i'm, I'm getting northern lights vibes so i hope you're all feeling it as well Right, let's see if I can pull out uh, some comments here. We've got one in from Vilma. Hi, Vilma. Vilma's just got the EM1 Mark III, so a new lens will have to wait a while. Understandable. Uh, but probably the 90mm will be the first next year. It will be worth the wait, Vilma. Absolutely worth the wait. Uh, speaking of the 90 mils, uh, William in Toronto has the 90 mil arrived today. Which I'm going to set some. Uh, I'm going to set some challenges on some of the forums online, actually, in terms of that 90 mil. That everybody that's got one to start shooting uh, at no less than two times magnification <laughs> between two and four only, and we'll see what we'll see what images we can glean from that. Um, okay, so Joseph uh, trying to decide between the 300 mil f4 beautiful lens uh, versus the 100 400 uh, versus the 4150 f 2.8 for birding uh, for wildlife and hiking that's a really interesting um, thought process in terms of comparing those lenses because each one of those lenses has their own benefits and disadvantages I would say it's something that you have to kind of consider if you think about a 300 millimeter f4 if you're not used to such a a long telephoto prime, then it can be kind of difficult to use initially because you have to pretty much keep removing the camera from, from your eye to see where your subject's gone if it leaves the frame. Or you'd have to get something like an EE1 dot sight, which helps you with peripheral vision. Uh, if you're used to a prime at that telephoto, it's absolutely superb. The quality is beautiful. 300 is an absolute gem to work with. The 100 to 400 gives you the flexibility of the range allows you to use the two times and the 1.4 teleconverters as well, which is really good. Well, the 4150 2.8, that's one of the lenses that I've put into my selection today because it's next level. I mean, it's not the longest of the telephotos, but it's absolutely amazing in what it does. Um, for me, the 4150 is such a great all-round lens. I was using it for, for a long, long time as a portrait lens uh, because the compression at 150 is just astounding. Um, so that kind of thing, it's, it's really difficult. You have to kind of weigh up your own situation, the distances that you're going to work with, and can you use a prime? If you can use a prime, the 300 F4 is superb, and it would be probably out of all those would be my choice if you're happy to use a prime at such a telephoto distance. 
Uh, po positive incoming vibe. Uh, Jan Zavino won. Love the sessions. Thank you. That's uh, really important to us to know that. It's really important to me as well, obviously, because we're the ones in front of the camera. So it's really important that we <laughs> we stay happy as well. So thank you for comments like that. Um, okay. <clears throat> So let's see. Oh, yeah, here we go. So Tom, Tom's retyped his question with an OM1. How do you see the subject when at high f stop with a 90 millimeter? The same answer. I'm using night LV um, to frame and compose at like f11. Yeah, on the 90 millimeter because that's where we're shooting at two times magnification at f11 to get you know, two millimeters of depth of field per shot. But that's obviously going to be very dark uh, when you're using flash. So yes, night LV, which is the process that I showed you earlier, Tom, it's exactly the same. I would use that as well. Um, right, let's jump it back in. I'll stay there for a second. I'll stay here on the edge. Let's see what happens. Okay, so the next lens is the ever faithful 12 to 40 millimeter pro, which of course we do have a Mark II version of now, which has improved um, weather sealing to match the OM1. So it's up to IP53 weather sealing on the Mark II. Uh, and some, you know, some little polishes around the edges as well, because the 12 to 40 is kind of, you know, an eight, nine year old lens. It's a nine year old lens, I think, now actually. So the Mark II was definitely ready for, ready for coming. It's a beautiful lens. It's a fantastic all rounder if you don't mind short range. So 12 to 50, uh, 12 to 40 short range, that equates to 24 to 80 millimeters in 35 millimeter standards. Um, your maximum aperture of f2.8 all the way through from 12 to 40, which is fantastic. Uh, minimum aperture of f22. Uh, 14 elements in nine groups in this one. Closest focusing distance 0.2 meters. This is really, really useful. So this is virgin on a macro lens you know, can really push that at 40 millimeters so you can really push that 20 centimeters i've pushed it a little bit further as well actually seven blades as are many uh 62 millimeter filter size one of our most common filter sizes actually 62 millimeters so if you've got a handful of lenses the likelihood is that many of them will be uh 62 millimeters so they can share accessories and things like that the 90 millimeter macro 62 millimeters 12 to 40 uh, all of the f1.2 prime pro lenses, 17, 25, and 45, 62 millimeters. So really, really useful um, filter thread size as well. 382 grams. It's it's nothing. I mean, it's there is there are things that are even more nothing in terms of weight, but this is nothing. And obviously, it's got the zero coating. This also has a fluorine coating. It's one of the newest ones, so it has the fluorine coating that makes the lens, uh, the front element. Um, fairly hydrophobic so if you get water on it you can just sort of shake or blow it off or, or wipe it off and that water is not going to stick to that front element and of course it has the movie stills compatible af as well super super cool the image that i chose for that is one of my absolute favorites in probably in my entire career with olympus and om system which spans just into 10 years now uh, and this is the light painted uh, swans by hanu hutomo uh, one of our fantastic light painting ambassadors. It's a beautiful thing. If you didn't see the viral video of Hanu painting this in a lake, uh, you've got to go and look for it. It's it's one of the most astounding things in the world, utilizing the very excellent live composite um, light edition mode. Um, it's just an absolute beautiful shot. The shot at sunset over the period of probably about uh, seven or eight minutes um, and, and absolutely stunning. The shot on the 12 to 40 Pro as well. So moving from the 12 to 40 Pro, I chose the 12 to 45 F4. Now, a couple of reasons why I chose this. The first one is because of the size of it. It is teeny tiny, as you can see there, bottom left, uh, sorry, bottom right image here with the hand. It's, it's the size of an apple. It weighs in at 254 grams for a Pro F4 lens with a range of 12 to 45, which is your 24 to 90 equivalent crop, uh, fact, uh, crop field of view um it's brilliant a travel lens it's perfectly suited to cameras like the em5 mark iii or the om5 um, it's really really designed for that kind of lightweight travel kit setup so if you're going to go with one lens this is absolutely perfect if you want small now there are other lenses which we'll come on to if you want to go with one lens that are great but are not as small as this this is as small as it gets in terms of travel 14 elements here in nine groups with the closest focusing distance again of 0.2 of a meter or 20 centimeters so you can do all that close-up work as well 
uh, a seven blade circular frame, uh, circular aperture setup, 58 millimeters th filter thread size on it. So you can tell that it's smaller because it's not matching that very concurrent 62 millimeter filter thread size that we do get a lot. Um, but 58 nonetheless is a very popular size. And again, you've got zero coating and it's MSC compatible as well. It's a superb uh, travel lens. I can't talk about this lens enough in terms of if I ever go on holiday, I've, you know, got my family, my children, and I've got lots of things going on when we go on holiday. If I don't want to take a lot of things to swap and change, the 12 to 45 um, on an OM5 is just my go-to setup because it, it, I can pretty much fit that in a jacket pocket. And, you know, that's an absolutely fantastic thing about it. The lens, uh, sorry, the image that I chose to show this off uh, is by another one of our fantastic ambassadors, which is um, Tom Ormerod, who is one of the most loveliest uh, guys that I've ever met um, on a par with the amazing Geraint Radford. Um, and he's an excellent landscape photographer, and he took this on an EM1 Mark III. And it's an absolute beautiful shot. It's testament to the rendering capability of the lens, the sharpness, and just sort of the beauty of of everything as well. Um, and I suspect that this was probably taken using the inbuilt live ND feature on the EM1 Mark III as well, but I'm not absolutely sure. I don't know if Tom's around tonight. So it's Tom, Tom Ormerod, if you're in the comments, if you're floating around, give me a shout and let me know if you used some filters, external or internal in this one. Um, okay, so let's head over to the comments. Let's look at some uh, comments or questions now uh, and see uh, exactly what's going on. I'm going to pull this one up because it's like a troubleshooter. Alan has asked when image stabilization on my Olympus 100 to 400 is on, there is a notable, not noticeable noise in the lens. Is this to be expected? So, uh, the, you will hear some noise from image stabilization. I shouldn't expect that you're hearing it all the time. If you're not halfway pressing the front shutter button, you shouldn't be hearing it. If you're hearing it when you halfway press to focus and you're holding that in order to take your shot, then yes, there is um, a normal noise level to be expected. But if you're concerned about it, you can always reach out to us, send us some examples, some recordings, or even just put it in for diagnostic. But I would say from what I can read in your message and your in your comment, I'm pretty sure that that's, a, that's an uh, acceptable amount of noise from what is a stabilization system. So one of the biggest questions that we get asked is, I can hear a noise from my camera and lens, is that normal? And most of the time, yes, it is uh, pretty much normal. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, Richard B, the non-pro lens, looks like the 30 mm macro, great lens, really sharp, 1.25 times life size. Shh, maybe that's in the selection. There you go. It is. It is the 30 mm We'll come to that later on. Well spotted, Richard. Well spotted. Fantastic stuff. I didn't put that up for too long. You really kind of zoned in on that one. Uh, I approve. <laughs> uh, another great positive comment. Yavas. Yavas, I think. Brilliant cameras and fantastic lenses. Love them. We love it. We love you as well. Fantastic stuff. Christopher. Uh, Christopher is considering switching out the 12 to 40 and the 40.50 f2.8 to the f4 versions. Good or bad idea? That depends on how much weight you want to save. 12 to 40 and 4150 f2.8 Pro lenses are superb in their own right. However, if weight is a is a, an absolute primary concern of yours and you want to shed what will probably be 700 grams of those two lenses combined, uh, then yes, it is a good idea if, if weight really is a key thing for you. Now, with the 12 to 45, I tended to not really worry about the f2.8 Um loss on the f4 40 to 150 depends if you're shooting if you're going to uh, go out and, and shoot some wildlife and you might be working in low light you might want to consider whether or not f4 is bright enough for you as a travel lens in terms of everyday things like people architecture the f4 is perfect um, but it does depend on your personal situation as well if weight is key then yes it's a great idea uh, and one more before we move on to the next lens um, from HS. How do the multipliers affect image quality on the pro lenses? So in my personal experience, it varies depending on what combination you set up. So if I was to say there's a perfect combination of um, teleconverters, the MC114 and the MC20, so 1.4 and two times, my perfect personal combination would be to pair the MC20 with a 4150 pro lens and to pair the 1.4, the MC14, with the 300 millimeter lens. And those 
combinations complement the lens and teleconverters capability to the point where image quality is negligible, like the difference. Um, but do it in reverse and you probably won't see the best of those. So it is circumstantial, but I would always put the two times converter with the 4150 f2.8 and the 1.4 with the 300. And any that you want on the 150 to 400 because that lens is just a blazing unicorn of light, <laughs> if that's even a way to describe a lens. Um, okay. Oh, time check's good. Let's go back. Uh, oh, no, that's probably about there. Let's look at the next one. The next one that I'm looking at is the 12 to 100. So, again, if you wanted um, a kind of all round, you know, do everything, walk about lens and not take it off your camera, and you didn't need it super light like the 12 to 45, then the 12 to 100 is the one that gets all the reviews. It gets all the raves. It gets everybody. When I go around traveling around meeting people and they tell me that 12 to 100 is never off my lens, off my camera. Uh, this is this is it. And this is the reason why. Uh, so you got your 24 to 200 millimeter equivalent and 35 millimeter standard. So that's a really nice range to work with. Uh, F4, from 12 to 100, you get an F4 uh, with a minimum aperture of F22. 17 elements in 11 groups. That's a lot of elements. There's a lot of work going on there, uh, but that's what's giving you that quality. There's huge amounts of glass moving around and giving you that really superb sharpness. Okay, really important. Closest focusing difference, distance varies depending on where you are. So 0.15 meters at the wide end, 0.45 meters at the telephoto end. So it does vary. But even so, if you think about the closest possible being the furthest possible at 45 centimeters, it's still really, really good. Seven blades, as are many. 72 millimeter filter size. So that matches a couple of our other lenses as well. Just over a key, uh, half a kilo, 561 grams. So, like I say, it's a big difference between the sort of 200 odd grams of the 12 to 45 uh, millimeter lens. Uh, but this is kind of like what you think about it's a horse or a course. Uh, you have to decide whether or not this is the distance you want to go for. You've got your zero coating and your MSC compatible. You have a few extra toys on the 12 to 100 that not all lenses have. So you have your IS, uh, Sync IS uh, switch on there. So on and off, you can switch that on and off. If you're going to a tripod, you can quickly switch it off. And it is a Sync IS lens as well. So it's going to combine with the IS in your body to create more stops and more power of stabilization, which is fantastic. And of course, you've got a lens function button that you can program to... Uh, any of the features that can be mapped within the respective camera that you're putting it onto. The image that I chose for this one is this superb dusk shot uh, by Marcin Dobas, uh, which was shot on an EM1 Mark II on the 12 to 100. And I just think it's absolutely superb. It's the landing shot at dusk, and it's a really, really beautiful image. So I popped that one in there. <clears throat> okay, so let's. Leave that up. Let's go back to some comments in here. Ken has just bought the 70, uh, 7 to 14, uh, and it'll be with him soon. Can't wait to get using it. You're going to love that lens. It's absolutely fantastic. Tim also has a 7 to 14. Uh, it's great for landscapes and nightscapes and works great with Starry Sky AF. It does as well. If you've got a camera that's uh, that has the Starry Sky AF functionality, then it is a superb thing to use with these wider angle lenses for astrophotography. Uh, speaking of which, Sikanda astrophotography in Chile. I'm so jealous. I don't even get astrophotography in darkest Cambridge, let alone Chile. I'm very, very jealous, Sikanda. I hope you enjoy uh, that trip. Okay, let's see if we can find a question, a techie question. Let's see. Oh, my filter, my um, comments have just refreshed in a really bizarre way. So bear with me while I find so many comments. I'm so sorry that I can't answer all these at uh, like now because there are so many of you. I mean, it's just a huge amount. My apologies. I am going to try and answer as many as possible. If I don't answer you in the live comments, please come back to the video in the standard set comments afterwards in the fixed comments and re-ask the question and I'll sneak in over the next couple of days and try and answer them as well. <laughs> John. This is a fair comment, John. John wants to trade in the 60 and the 30 for a 90 millimeter. I mean, I'd say that was an equal trade uh, if I was asked personally. But, um, you know, I don't run a retail shop. Sorry, John. I'd be totally behind you if I did, though. Um, 
This is an interesting question from uh, from Jersey. Jersey's asking if there's a way to compare lens AF speed. I mean, not really from a consumer point of view, unless you have some pretty pretty nifty equipment. Um, that's a tricky question, that one, really, because a lot of it happens so quickly. Uh, there are some differences when it comes to things like macro lenses because uh, macro lenses do focus on a slightly slower scale, which is probably measurable if you don't have all the funky equipment. But most stuff really needs kind of micro second equipment and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm going to say no on a consumer level, Jersey, I'm afraid. Um, okay. So one more uh, techie question. Let me see. Boo, 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 boo. Okay, Claire has a great question. Uh, hello, Dax. Hi. So for some of you know me in the iteration of Dax or David, I don't mind. Either way, you want to call me Dax, that's fine. You want to call me David, I don't have a problem with that. There are some names I don't like to be called, though. They're pretty obvious, but Dax and David is fine. Hey, Claire. Um, I said that most lenses have seven blades. Uh, it's not a dim question at all. Why do blades matter and what's the impact? So the more blades you have, um, it's generally suggested that the smoother the bokeh or the out-of-focus um, areas are. So if you have specular highlights that turn into beautiful sort of bokeh balls like this, then the more blades you have suggested that it is a smoother experience. It's pretty much that simple as well. The less blades you have as well, it can sound quite choppy. Uh, so that's quite important. Uh, okay, let's go back over. Quick time check. Perfect. Let's go and see another f4 lens another one of the shrunken versions of the pro lenses so this is the 4150 f4 so it's the f4 version of our 2.8 pro lens uh 80 to 300 millimeter equivalent maximum aperture of f4 through the range from 4150 and a minimum aperture of f22 uh 15 elements so working quite hard in there nine groups of 15 elements the closest focusing distance of 0.7 meters so a little bit further out but for the range still very very good seven blades there you go. Uh, 62 millimeter filter size. So another one, another tick in the 62 millimeter filter size. So if you've got loads of accessories that take 62 millimeter threads, then you're good to go. 382 grams. So way less than half a kilo. Really, really low down there. So again, in terms of travel, this is on a par at a telephoto end with the 12 to 45 F4. And this kind of almost... It, it, it finishes that trinity of f4 lenses you have the 12 to 45 the 8 to 25 and the 40 to 150 f4 range done you know if you're happy to travel around with the f4s that's your range and you're there uh it has the coating the zero coating and it's msc compatible as well it is so super light it's ridiculously light uh it's a shocker when you first pick this up if you've never handled one before it is so super light and the image that i've brought into this is by the amazing uh daniel villardson who interestingly at the end of the month if you go over to uh if you if you don't have the link already uh, we'll try and put it in the comments afterwards. If you go to the OM system events page, you can access the events through your My OM system account through that as well. And in there, you'll see that there is an event with Daniel. There is a Zoom uh, that I'll open up for him, but Daniel is speaking for the whole Zoom on his photography and his travels. And this is one of his images here with the 40 to 150 F4. Daniel's images are absolutely beautiful. So if you want to go ahead, uh, that is a ticketed Zoom. Uh, so there was a charge for that Zoom. It's a very minor charge, but I've seen some of the presentation that Daniel's prepared for it, and it's absolutely astonishing. It's going to be at the end of March. So go ahead and find that on the events page if you'd like to attend it. And Daniel's a really, really nice person as well. Such a nice person to listen to speak about what he's been doing. Um, uh, and he stars in the EM5, you know, the OM5. <laughs> he stars in the OM5 uh, trailer video where they're hiking up through the hills and the mountains. So that's his image, and it's absolutely glorious. It's a beautiful view through those hills onto the mountain range. My next lens is the 4150F 2.8, and this has been one of my favorites for many years because of its flexibility. I did mention earlier that I do like to use it for portraiture because at 150, the compression on a on a on a face or a sort of uh, a half to three quarter level portraiture is just absolutely superb. F 2.8, if you can use it, is fantastic. Again, I would use this quite a lot of f4 with that kind of compression. Um, 
So it's your 80 to 300 millimeter equivalent and 35 millimeter standards, 2.8 right through the range, uh, F22 minimum aperture if you need it, 16 elements in 10 groups, working really, really hard, all internal focus, has the lens function button on there if you want to program a map function in there, has the tripod tripod foot included as well so really really good nice nice bit of kit uh, nine blades with a um, 72 millimeter filter thread now the weights on this one vary it's not the lightest 760 grams so three quarters of a kilo without the tripod foot and 880 with it but well worth that those few extra grams absolutely love this lens one of my favorites it's been around it was the second pro lens released after the 12 to 40 f 2.8 superbly built and um and one of my favorite images that we have of this is by our very own claire voyle um who took this shot of this beautiful herd of elephants on the 4150 uh absolutely stunning the rendition the colors rendering absolutely fantastic and she takes she took a lot of uh, photographs of elephants and gorillas with this lens and i think i've shown off one of claire Boyle's gorilla images before which is absolutely beautiful so emotive um but elephants i have a real thing for elephants as well so this is a beautiful one a tiny little baby ones in there as well different ages it's just a superb image uh, and shows off the quality of the 4152.8 really really nicely um, <laughs> my namesake's in. Hey, David in Scotland. It's good to see you. Use a gray background. It matches the weather in Scotland. I can just turn all the lights off and it'll match the weather in Scotland as well. Fantastic comment. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Oh, Corey would love a new set of F 5.6 or F4 body cap lenses. That's interesting. That's really good, uh, really good comment, actually. Owen for life. Hashtag Owen for life, Corey. I got you. Uh, F4 point, uh, F5.6 or F4 body cap lenses. That'd be incredible. Yeah, so the body cap lenses that we've got at the moment are like F8, but can you imagine? Still a little bit stubbier, but mm, they would be good. That's a great comment. Thanks, Corey. Love it. Carol um, Archdale over there in Northern Ireland. Great to have you in as always, Carol. I hope you and uh, Peter are well. The 90 millimeter lens is great, much easier to use than the 60 millimeter. <laughs> I can't say anything about that, Carol. I love the 60 millimeter. I never found a problem with it. However, I did spend many, many days across many, many years teaching others how to not have a problem with it as well. Um, the 90 is great and it is far easier to handle straight off the bat. Uh, than the 60 millimeter, you're right. Uh, there's a huge difference though. That is a pro lens and I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'll be enjoying it as well once my four seasons in one week settles down. Uh, time check. Okay, let's go ahead and look at my next lens. So I've thrown in a prime for this one. I've thrown in the 45 millimeter F1.2 prime because until this lens came out, my favorite portrait lens, which I used huge amounts, both in natural light and in a studio environment, was the 45 millimeter f1.8. Let's say it, the plastic fantastic, as everybody knows it, what a superb lens that f1.8 was. The f1.2 takes this to next dimensional level, really, in terms of sharpness, in terms of compression, in terms of bokeh from specular highlights, in terms of everything, it's absolutely superb. The image that I'm going to show you that I chose from this just absolutely oozes, not what you would expect a 45 millimeter image to be for a start, but it just has so much to it. If the 45 millimeter F1.2 was a soup, then the image is the soupiest soup you'll ever see, I promise you. But let's have a quick look at this one. So there are some differences with the 1.2 ranges that are really, really important. Maximum aperture of f1.2, okay? Minimum aperture of f16, okay? You can't stop down any further than f16 on these lenses, okay? Because of the way that they're designed. 14 elements across 10 groups. Really beautiful design, as you can see there in the breakdown. Uh, closest focusing half a, half a meter. 0.50 of a meter, 50 centimeters, nine blades, 62 millimeter filter size, as are all the F1.2s. Uh, just coming in under half a kilo, 410 grams, really, really superb weight, lovely balance on the one series of anything. So an OM1 or an EM1, really, really nice balance with those forward grips. Zero coating, fluorine coating on this one as well, MSC compatible. The image that I chose was by the phenomenal Frank Ruckert, uh, over in Germany, 
taken on the pen F. Wait for the comments to blow up when I say pen F. Let's get it going. This is probably one of the most beautiful, idyllic, peaceful uh, images that I've seen in, in a long, long time. I love this image by Frank. It's got such a superb feeling to it. It's got a really nice dynamic. It's got excellent composition. And it really throws that distance into perspective and what's going on behind that. It's just absolutely beautiful. I love it. Hope you love it. There's some superb colors in there as well. I know Frank loves it. Uh, and that's the 45 millimeter F1.2. Um, absolutely glorious compression for days. I'll leave that up so we can all enjoy it a little bit. And we'll see what else we've got in our comments while I try and chat and read at the same time. Gary is visiting Europe this year. Well, when you visit Europe, you have to leave Europe and come over and visit us in the UK. I wish you didn't have to say it like that, but I do. So maybe you can come and see us here. What single lens would I recommend to take? Honestly, for Europe, for the beautiful kind of old cities and things like that, for me, 12 to 45. If you don't mind a bit of extra grams, 12 to 100. So depending on how much weight is a key thing for you, Gary, 12 to 45 F4 or the 12 to 100 F4, one of those two for cityscapes and anything like that, you've got that lovely 12 mil and, um, and then it really does depend on how much you are prepared to put in your bag. The 12 to 100 is not heavy by any means, uh, but everybody's different in what their expectations of carry weight is. So 1245 or 12100 would be what I would say. And if you come to the UK, give us a shout. Um, okay, let's see what else we've got in here. Ooh, yeah, there's a good one. John would bring the 12 to 40. So yeah, not far off. That's the 2.8 version. Corey, uh, Corey's got all the ideas. I drag Corey into the uh, into the brainstorming session. Corey wants brand new uh, M Zuiko reflex mirror lenses. Crikey, we would be branching back out into those, wouldn't we, Corey? But I do love your thought process. And one more. Oh, I got to bring it up though because Christopher says Hannah is an absolute legend. You are so right. I'm leaving that one right up there man, while I find my next tech question. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a great one. So we'll, we'll do this one before we move on. Richard's asked about the relative image quality of the 12 to 40 and the 12 to 45 at equivalent F stops. It's pretty negligible. If you look at the MTF charts for both of these lenses, they're super close. If you shoot the 12 to 40 Mark II alongside the 12 to 45 F4, you're going to see sharpness versus, uh, focal length and, um, depth of field and all that kind of thing and matching around about the same sort of level. If I was to pick one over the other, I would say the 12 to 40 probably marginally goes higher, not to a point where I think most humans would be able to de detect it by eye, I would say. But what a fantastic question. Right, let's move this through. Ta da! Yes, Richard, you were right. My non pro selection for tonight was the 30 millimeter macro because, despite the fact that it sits quietly in its macro corner and nobody really shouts about it too much, it is a wondrous piece of kit. It is phenomenal for many, many reasons. No, it's not a pro lens. No, it's not a metal build. No, it's not the fastest thing in the world. But f3.5 on a macro lens is still fantastic because most of the time we're shooting more than that. I don't think. I remember the last time I shot below or wider than f5.6 on a macro lens anyway. So this is a 60 millimeter equivalent at 35 millimeter standards. So it's not the 60 at MFT. Uh, it's a 60 and 35 millimeter equivalents here. Maximum aperture of f3.5 regardless, doesn't matter in macro because honestly, you're not going to see much at f3.5 anyway. You need to stop down for more depth of field and a minimum aperture of f22. It's quietly seven elements in six groups. It's a simple, gentle lens, but it really, really does the trick. Closest focusing distance. This is what's phenomenal about this lens. It's like we ripped the lens from a TG6 and put it into this casing. 0 0.095 meters. That's less than one centimeter focusing distance from the front element. It's absolutely ridiculous. So close. Combine it with a flash or an STF-8 or some extra light to get that close. But for textures, you know, things like textiles, barks, 
flower petals, grasses, food. It's a great food lens. It's phenomenal. Um, that's where this lens really kind of shines. 46 millimeter filter size, a poultry 128 grams. You know, like I said, there are apples way more than that. Has the zero coating. Is MSC if you want to use it for macro movies as well. And the image that I chose for this one is this phenomenally simplistic yet incredibly detailed image from Takahiko Sato, uh, which I couldn't even tell you what creature this is. It just fascinates me. It's some form of insect. And if anybody knows, please put it in the comments. I'm usually pretty good on these, but this is the head. I have had to crop this slightly to make it work for the presentation, but it's absolutely phenomenal. And this 30 millimeter has captured it absolutely brilliantly. I love the darkness and I love the way that it just kind of creates itself in there. Uh, beautiful on an EM1 Mark III as well. So one a, a fantastic camera. Uh, shot at f11. And there you go. That's it. Shot at f11. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I will leave that up for a second because I have got about five minutes left with you. I've timed it quite well, I think. I'm going to pick up this question from Ron, who is uh, saying something that comes up quite a lot uh, when trying to capture birds in flight with the Olympus 100 to 400 on an EM1 Mark III, is it better to turn off the IBIS or leave it on auto? So what you should generally do with that lens combination is you should have the, uh, the image stabilization on in the camera and on in the lens. And if you're using the 400 millimeter end more frequently, you should choose the lens IS priority option in the AF menu. And that will give you the best uh, combination uh, of that lens and camera. And this question comes up a lot, Ron. So you're not the only one there. Um, IKL 111, which is the best Zuiko lens for astrophotography? You know what? I could, I could really upset people by giving you my personal favorite. We've got a fantastic um, OM user called Ben Chappelle who runs the Narrowband channel uh on astrophotography on youtube so if you're not familiar with ben's work in the narrowband channel head over there have a quick look he's doing some really really great things with uh telephoto lenses with all sorts of different lenses and he's uh, talking about them all the time um, i'm not an expert in astrophotography in terms of picking the best lens because i think astrophotography has its different facets as does macro photography so you might be looking at deep space you might be looking at um at star trails there are different kind of levels of it for me i'm not a deep space photographer if i was going to take astrophotography i would definitely be using the 7 to 14 or the 8 millimeter f1.8 fisheye because it would probably be star trails with a reasonably kind of um terrestrial foreground you know like mountain ranges and things like that uh but i definitely recommend going ahead and looking at ben's channel uh over at the narrowband uh thanks for your question okay let's take a couple more i think let's just see if that's the oh no so i'll just go to one like one last slide for the real nerdy ones across you because i'll be talking about elemental groups and setups and i'll be talking about dsa lenses eda lenses shr lenses uh and obviously you can go back and pause this and have a real kind of look at the explanations here but a brief kind of touch on what those elemental setups mean when we talk about things like dsa uh, DSA means dual super aspherical lenses. And these are really, really important to give us kind of edge to edge clarity. We have, th weirdly, the lenses get thinner towards the center. Um, and that's really, really helpful to compensate for any things like aberration or, or you sort of chromatic aber aberration towards the edges where you see artifacts. Gives us that really high def look. Then we have extra low dispersion aspherical lenses, which helps cut down all of the glare and the haze and things um, that, that appear across multiple wavelengths of color. And then we have an SHR, which is the super high refraction index, which basically focuses that light down as sharp as it can do. And all of those are built into different sets of elements across the lenses. And that's what makes our lenses as good as they are. Um, and every single lens has a slightly different elemental setup. So when you come back and you can pause that, and you can have a good read and be a real nerdy about it like me. Uh, 
And of course, I did say at the start, this is an advert with education because we, there is a promotion at the moment. We're not going to kind of jump around and say that we're not talking about things that are in promotion. They are in promotion. These lenses are all in some sort of financial benefit, whether it's cash back, depending on what country you're in, or whether it's an applied discount already, depending on what country you're in. Uh, and this is a little list of everything. There's a huge amount of those lenses, not just the nine that I've covered today. So if you were sitting there thinking, there's a lens that I want, but I'm just waiting for it to just come down a little bit uh, for the new price, maybe now is the time to look at it again and reassess whether or not it's a good time to buy it. Defy the moment. Thanks for watching. That is my uh, presentation on lenses. I am going to just pick up uh, on a couple of extra uh, comments or questions in here before I say goodbye to everybody. Um, Mary's asked a great question. Would you put the two times converter to the 100 to 400 non-pro lens? You can. You just have to bear in mind that there is a compromise when that happens because you're doubling up on an already variable aperture lens. So you're going to find yourself heading up towards f14 at the top end with a two times converter on there. That has obviously a couple of implications in terms of light gathering and, of course, stopping down. The further you stop down in terms of aperture, the more you can get diffraction and that can affect sharpness. So it's all about whether or not you can take the comparison. I've always created the Loch Ness Monster analogy in, in terms of how much we degrade an image uh, to get longer length, how much higher ISO we use. If it's super important that you get that shot, yeah, of course you're going to put a converter on or you're going to hit those high ISOs. Like if you saw the Loch Ness Monster, you would definitely shoot at 104,000 ISO because every picture of the Loch Ness Monster is grainy as heck, but it's a picture. That's if you believe in the Loch Ness Monster, but that's a conversation for a different day. Uh, Mary, it depends on how much you'd like to compromise on that lens. Um, okay, let's find another quick one. Um, and again, I have to apologize because I literally can't answer every single question or comment in here, but I appreciate all of the positivity that I'm seeing. Fantastic. Oh, Emily's in. Hi, Emily. Uh, Emily's got some great stuff going on at the moment. Again, Emily also has a, a channel on YouTube. Go ahead and find some of the most recent videos. 90 millimeter macro lens. Emily, we love it. Some great content coming out of there. And Emily says, yeah, the 4150 f2.8 is a superb lens. Yeah. Oh, great minds think alike, Emily. Thanks very much. Uh, cheers for popping in. Okay, let's see. And the problem is, is, well, we get to this hour and I don't really want to go anywhere, but I get, you know, it's almost like this virtual crook comes in and starts to pull me off and, and, and tell me that I've got to go. So I'm going to pick up. Uh, let's see if I can pick a really juicy one uh, for the last one. Oh, it's so difficult to kind of chat and, and pick one out. I'm just going to grab. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Jeff's saying that the 8 to 25 is great for astro photography and star trails. That's a brilliant comment. Ben's in. Ben is in from the Narrowband channel. There you go. Ben has made that comment, uh, which doesn't quite come up uh, in its entirety on my screen, but it says the best lens for astro photography depends on what you want to do, which I think is pretty much where I was heading. And then just pointing them over to you, Ben. So thank you very much for jumping in uh, and letting us know that you're there. Um, you know what? I'm going to bring this one in. This is a juicy one. And I'm going to bring it in because it has formed part of many discussions around forums and things since we released the 90 millimeter macro. Uh, Chris is asking about a collar for the 90 millimeter, 90 millimeter macro. We don't make one specifically for the 90 millimeter macro. I am fully aware that one of our other lenses has a collar on it. 4150 or 2.8 Pro. And that fits on the 90 millimeter macro, but, but, not, but not by design. So... And the only thing I have to say, and I'm always as honest as I can be with all of you, is at your own risk, okay? And at the moment, we don't have any plans for a collar for that, but things change. So keep your eyes peeled and your ears tuned to the ground of Micro Four Thirds and see what comes up. But at the moment, um, uh, unofficially, that, that collar is not designed for the 90 millimeter macro. Okay, what a fantastic hour with you all so positive. I really love that. I really appreciate everybody that comes in as well, because it's so important and it's so nice to have that support from you. Um, I will come back in and try and answer as many questions as possible in those further comments. Uh, you, you might need to re-put paste your comment into the fixed uh, comments once the video has, has come out of live uh, status, and I'll try my very best to answer them. 
for now um it's been lovely i will be back with uh lots more videos and i think back to tech thursday um for the next month there are lots of stuff coming up with the other guys from the team as well the ask me anything sessions are coming back up we have different uh, ones listed i think now the next one is going to be a landscape session with some of the uh, other guys as well the usual team um so enjoy those but i will see you next time uh, here on back to tech thursday uh, but for now enjoy shooting and take care